a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello and thank you for joining me on another episode of Living History. Today, we've got a really fascinating topic that I'm looking forward to bringing to you. It's about women pilots, Australian women pilots, and it's a subject that we don't know enough about. There's some absolutely incredible stories about females in the air and these wonderful things they've achieved over the years, and we just don't give it enough coverage. So I'm really delighted there's a new book on the subject, which is called Australian Women Pilots, Amazing True Stories of Women in the Air. And joining me to discuss it is the author of that book, Kathy Mexted. Kathy, thanks so much for joining us on Living History. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Kathy, tell me, tell me your story. This is your first book, and I and it's reading all about you, your biography. I was quite fascinated to to learn your story and your passion and your connection with flight. Tell us your story and how you came to this place to be writing a book. So, um, my father had an aeroplane when I was a kid, and so flying was not new to me. I used to go out with him, and you know, felt quite comfortable hopping in and out of aeroplanes. And in my mid-20s, late 20s, I came back from to our small hometown of Finlay after doing what all small-town kids do, which is leave home and go as far away from the small town as they can. Um, and I did that for about 10 years. And when I came home, I decided that that was a perfect time to learn to fly. It was something I had on my bucket list. And so I went down to Tokemal to the old World War II, beautiful aerodrome there with um, its big sealed cross runways that are 1,200 metres long, I think, and um, went to the flying school, handed over the cash and learnt to fly. It was 1991 and 92. So I did my restricted licence over one year and then my unrestricted the following year. I was just working as a nurse and um, so about half my weekly wage would go to my weekly flying lesson. That's incredible. And you, you have a connection with flying beyond just being an aircraft, don't you? Because you've, uh, you've done various jobs where you've told the story of flying, where you've been connected to flying as well, haven't you? So I was always a bit of a storyteller. I loved writing letters and um, communicating, I guess, but I didn't really explore it until my mid-40s when I was at home with toddlers and a teenager. I went off to uni and did a diploma of professional writing and editing. And from there, I was dead keen to start writing. And so the first day at uni was the day I had my first story published in the local newspaper. And I just went from there. I never imagined I'd be able to write aviation because I'm surrounded by professional pilots. So I was a bit intimidated by that, by their knowledge and um, expertise. But the lecturer at uni said... Um, you know, you should be writing aviation stories. You've got amazing connections. And I said, but I, I don't know enough, you know, <laughs> about aviation. And he said, uh, my girlfriend said, you don't need to know it. You just need to know the people who know it so that you can tell it. So that completely shifted the way I felt about myself. <clears throat> and so um, uh, my husband suggested why don't I pitch to AOPA magazine, AOPA Australia, and their magazine is Australian Pilot. And so I ended up writing for them for about five years and unofficially sub-editing and proofreading. So from there, I was offered the job of editor of Air Sport, which is the Sport Aircraft Association's magazine. And they're the guys who build their own aeroplanes. And they're like um, Lawrence Hargrave of today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're down in the shed tinkering and figuring it out. And I love dealing with those guys because they're real thinkers and makers, you know. They're not just about flying. They're about making. It's fascinating that you, the way you describe that as saying you, you don't just have to, you know, you don't have to know everything about it. You just have to know the people who do know everything about it. Because it's in, in a lot of ways, it's my approach to history as well. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what I love about doing these podcasts and speaking to people like yourself, because it opens up a whole area of knowledge that you otherwise wouldn't know. It must, you must have had some fascinating con connections and associations with, with amazing pilots over the years. Most of my writing has been um, general aviation and so um, everybody has a similar story but everybody's story is unique and so I just enjoy getting people to tell this story. Most people love to talk about the aeroplanes, don't they? <laughs> yeah. 
So um, it's it's a great joy to be able to bring that story to life. So they will usually say, oh, I can't write. I don't know how to write. And I just say, just put the story down, answer these few questions. I give them five to ten questions. And they just answer the questions and then I can put it into a story and I'll send it back to them and, you know, they'll just tweak it. And um, and then once it's in the magazine with the photos and the layout and the colour and the glossy pages and I've had some really beautiful responses and that's where the real joy is for me is being able to give people this experience and to share their stories um, with a wider audience I've had lots of feedback from readers of Air Sport who say, I just like reading about other builders and their challenges and, you know, how long they spent in the shed trying to get those wing bolts, you know, lined up or something. And, um, yeah, so I think it's a great thing to do, to share stories, share your vulnerabilities, share your successes um, and, um, yeah, promote aviation generally. And you've now written this book, this this great book, Australian Women Pilots. Was was the story of 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 great female pilots in Australia was that something that's always you've always been passionate about, or as you went through the process of developing the book, did you discover these stories and, and learn what a great uh, history we have in female aviation? When I was learning to fly in ninety one ninety two, I remember saying to the instructor, "Is there any other girls around?" Because <laughs> I graduated with one woman and. 25 men at our flying school and there just didn't seem to be many women around there was a dutch lady who girl who was gliding and she did her pilot powered license at the same time uh and there was one female instructor who came and went she and, and there was another girl michelle lappin she was very excited about flying too and so i kind of always was looking for the women where were the women at that time, Nancy Bird had just put out her book, My God, It's a Woman. And I loved the title so much I bought it, read it, learned about the Women Pilots Association. And very quickly we moved. I married a pilot. We were living in Sydney and I joined the Women Pilots Association. And so suddenly there were women around me, lots of women who were flying. So um, <clears throat> I kind of dropped out of the association and then came back to it about five years ago after probably a 20-year absence. And I was at the conference, there, they have an annual conference and it was in South Australia. And a lady called Patricia Toole got up to speak about her experiences flying in New Guinea. And she was the first female pilot in New Guinea and she flew up there in 1952 and 53. And her boss was Bobby Gibbs, who's well known to aviation historians as um, the World War II flying ace. And he, after the war, set up an airline in New Guinea called Gibbs Seapik Airways. And he employed Pat and she went up there and just slotted in with the men and um, flew for him for two years. The book tells about a dozen or so amazing stories of, of these of these women and their their achievements in aviation. We're going to focus today on four women that, that, that you've selected who are quite representative of, of, of the women in the book. Well, why don't we start with Patricia, since that was the, the person you just mentioned as part of the inspiration for the book. Why don't we talk about Patricia's story? Yep. So she was 88 when I heard her speak, and unfortunately she passed away a couple of weeks later. But when I approached her and said, I'm thinking of writing a book on women pilots, could I, any chance I could put you in it? And her eyes lit up and she said she thought that was a great idea. <laughs> and so, um, so I had the story that I'd heard from her. I had conversations with her in the next couple of days. And after she passed away, her family gave me her version. She'd written a little book, um, you know, it was just a typed manuscript thing. Um, of what she thought was her story and um, that was the basis for the story for, for my story on her so she went up to New Guinea she was a hairdresser and her brother was at uni and she felt that he was doing good things and that she was being left behind and a DC-3 descended into Coffs Harbour Airport and she thought I'm going to have a go at that so she went out to the Coffs Harbour Aero Club and she went for a flight and she just loved it so she got her pilot's licence, she graduated and then her brother was living in New Guinea and Bobby Gibbs was having a conversation with him and lamenting that he couldn't get any of the wartime pilots to come back to New Guinea to fly for him. 
and um, they didn't like the countryside, you know, the landscape. It's a very difficult landscape. It's considered one of the most difficult countries in the world to fly around because of the terrain and the weather. And so he said, what about my sister? She's just got her licence and she's doing good things. And so he said, fine, send her up. And so Pat had the interview and um, she arrived in Port Moresby at Jackson Strip, which is the main airport there, and um, there was nobody there to meet her. <laughs> Bobby Gibbs was busy at that time buying uh, Junkers for, to expand his airline. So he was busy up in WeeWack and then he'd gone off to Europe. And so Pat arrived to, um, you know, chirping crickets at the airport. She tracked down the manager, the chief pilot, and by that was on Sunday. And by Wednesday, she was in the Lodestar. She was meant to be the first officer on this um, Lodestar. And they departed on their first trip to Popendetta, which was across the Kokoda, through the Kokoda Gap, over the Kokoda Track. Um, but they'd hardly even left the circuit area when the air traffic control called them up and said, do you realise your port side engine's on fire? And so they had to come back and land. <laughs> and so that was welcome. That was her second welcome to New Guinea in a week. And um, she quickly realised this was no glitzy airline that she joined, but it was, you know, a very much a hard-working um, skin of your fly by the seat of your pants type of airline. Um, within a week or a couple of weeks, they had to go to up to Weewak, so from Port Moresby up over the mountains, the highlands. They landed at Goroka, and she said that was the most – her first sighting of those amazing highlands in that beautiful setting. And then they swooped down over the palm-fringed beaches of Weewak, and when she alighted from the aeroplane, all the boys had heard about this female pilot and it was such an unusual thing back then. They all lined up at the airport waiting to see this bird, you know, and they gambled on her being an old bat. They th thought she was going to be an old boiler. And she got out of the um, Norseman and um, she, she was no old boiler. She was only 23 and she had been a hairdresser, so I imagine she had fabulous hair and came out looking fairly lovely. And so they all took a deep breath and one of them nudged the boss and he said, what are you going to do with her? And he said, marry her, of course. <laughs> and so that's what happened. Um, but she said no when he proposed to her. Um, she said, no, I'm here to fly and it's not what I want. I'm too young and I've got this great career that I'm establishing. But um, the next day she changed her mind. But she had some fabulous adventures. So she arrived on Black Friday in Weewak. And there was work to do because all the Norsemen, the, uh, because of a faulty maintenance directive left over from World War II, the, it was something about tightening a screw half a turn too far and it, all the, um, I think like eight of the ten Norsemen were grounded and they couldn't work out what was happening with all these engine failures. So Pat and Renus, her chief pilot, got sent off on a charter up out onto the East Sea Peak River somewhere and 10 minutes later, as Pat described, she said the propeller came sharply into view and then she stopped and everyone just had to digest that and she said the engine had stopped dead. And she said it was a real pity actually because it was the only engine we had at the time and um, <laughs> so they had to do a forced landing and then it took them 10 hours to walk home through the jungle. And so that was her introdu introduction to WeeWack. And those stories just kept coming. Um, and over the next two years, she had plenty of those experiences. As a female pilot yourself, how did it make you feel being in the presence of these extraordinary women and, have, and hearing their stories of, of all these things they'd achieved in decades past? How, how, how did that affect you emotionally? My flying experience is very tame and very uh, general aviation. So I, have, I do not have a tale that I could tell them that would keep them on the seat of their edge of their seat but um, there was a great feeling of camaraderie of uh, women's stories you know um, because she was another woman I guess if a man had told the story I would have said that's a great story but because it was a woman and there were so few women pilots it just felt like a little club you know um, and she was such a good storyteller and the final the one that really got me in was when she said she was flying from Weewak to Wanamo along the coast and back again and then she had to go up into the mountains to a hill town and she got swamped by cloud and she ended up forced landing on a riverbed 
and she was out there for 40 hours before somebody walked in and found her. Um, and that's a really gripping story. They, they, they found her from the air and they dropped her some inedible food, some water, cigarettes, um, a Luger pistol and a bottle of rum. And so when this patrol officer, <laughs> I know, where's the, you know, oh, she had barley sugar and carnation milk in the freight. So she hooked into that as well. But um, the patrol officer from Drekakir Station, which was about 10, 10 to 15 miles to the east, he made an educated guess and he set off and um, he located her. And he arrived after a 10 hour walk out of the darkness of the night in the teeming rain with his three local police assistants. And by the light of a swinging hurricane lamp, they greeted each other. And his name was Jock McGregor. And Pat said, Jock, would you like a rum? Because that was all she had. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, good God, I walked through the jungle for eight hours. I find this white woman alive in the jungle. And she offers me rum. I think he was scratching his head thinking, only in New Guinea. You know? <laughs> Just, so, um, just extraordinary stories. Um, yeah. Speaking of extraordinary stories, one of the ones that I really enjoyed was the story of um, Marty Gething and her work uh, during the Second World War. Tell us a little bit about her. So after Pat Tool, I knew I had to make a book and um, I decided on two more stories. So I had three to start with and then I went looking for the best stories I could find. And uh, so I, start, I did a timeline starting with Nancy Bird in the 30s and then in the 40s, I thought, now what happened in the 40s? Oh, that's right, World War II. So um, I thought, well, women didn't fly during World War II. So they were all grounded in Australia. But I found an Australian lady called Marty Gething, who, well, Marty Gep, her name was, from Melbourne. And she had gone to England to be presented at court. You know how they go and bow to the king. And... Um, but on the way over, she met Richard Gething, who had just broken a record for the Royal Air Force, a long-distance record. And um, him and his uh, captain were on their way back to England on the boat. And um, so Marty met Richard there, who she later married. And they ended up living in England during World War II. And he went off um, to Africa and Asia for most of the war, leaving her alone in England. But she had a pilot's licence and so she joined the Air Transport Auxiliary and they were the civilian organisation that delivered aircraft, just the bare bones of the aircraft from the factory to the airfields and then they'd be fitted out with armaments and radios and, you know, all the other good stuff that you need to um, be able to fly into battle. And so um, I'm assuming your list, or you know about the Air Transport Auxiliary? Uh, I don't know a lot about them. Please explain. feel free to talk a little bit more about them. Yeah, so it was set up by Pauline Gower, who was a pilot, and she had some political connections, and so she was able to make stuff happen. So it was a volunteer organisation. Because the men were required for active duty, then these volunteer civilians were able to fill this role, which was delivering the aeroplanes. And um, the women were initially only going to fly the tiger moths and, the, you know, the little light stuff. Um, but very quickly, the... Need, as happens in war, you know the need for um, the need for them to be men and the need for them to be tall was usurped by um, the wartime uh, panic, you know, that was on. And so Marty was only something like 150 centimeters tall, um, but eventually she did get in and she flew 26 different types of aircraft. So they'd have a, a book of ferry pilots' notes. And it was just one page note on each aircraft type that they could possibly ask to fly. And um, she could fly three, four, five, six different aeroplanes in a day. She could be in a spitfire of one variation, then a walrus and then a, um, you know, whatever, all different types. And they wouldn't know till they got to the aerodrome. They'd just get given a piece of paper and they'd walk along and go, number 46, yep, that's it. Okay, it's a spitfire mark, whatever. And she'd fl flip through the book and find the takeoff stall and the handling notes and get in and fly it off. And they had no, um, no radios and no instruments. So they could only fly um, supposedly in fine weather using a paper map and their knowledge of the ground, of the landscape. But they'd fly, she was based at Southampton, and, which is south of London, and she would be required to go up to the north of Scotland 
I think Lossy Mouth is the ref um, base up there and also over to Wales and all over the place. It's quite a remarkable story and, yeah, it was a great one to find. Just extraordinary. I'm not a pilot myself, but as a pilot, how how daunting is that challenge that you could turn up at the at the aerodrome ready to fly and be presented with an aircraft you've never flown before? Yeah, well, I would think it'd be terribly daunting, but I guess everybody especially one without instruments, is... <laughs> without <laughs> navigation and radios. They must have had basic instruments like altimeter and um, turn and bank and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I never got into what actually was in them. But I know there was a lot that was left out of them. Um, uh, yeah, so everyone around her was doing the same thing. They did have some accidents and there were a lot of uh, obstacles to be aware of. You know, they had the barrage balloons to um, watch out for. There was also the fear. One one of the issues was the fear that some trigger-happy uh, guard at the aerodrome might think that they were not one of the local pilots and get shot down accidentally. Um there was also the fear that they'd be attacked by enemy aircraft thinking that they were, which they were, you know, allied allied aeroplanes, but they were just delivering them. So they didn't have any guns to shoot back if somebody fired at them. Just, a, just an extraordinary story. I, one of the things I really enjoyed about reading this book was was the fact that you didn't just tell these these stories of World War II and bravery and, and, and adventure flying over the jungles of New Guinea, but you also told stories of, of modern pilots and and the, the challenges that they faced and the achievements that they've made in, in a modern context. And, and one of those that I really enjoyed was the story of Nicole Forrester. Tell us, tell us about Nicole and, and her journey to, uh, to aviation. <laughs> oh, I love Nicole. <laughs> Everybody loves Nicole. Nicole spoke at, also at a Women Pilots Conference. It was the following year after I'd heard Pat speak. Nicole was the speaker at the next year's conference or one of the speakers. And she stood up there in her Air Force um, uniform and told the story of how she got into the Air Force. So her story, it just, you know, her Air Force career is just a wrap-up at the end, really. But um, I didn't really want the book to be all about I did this great thing, you know. Um, It needed to have just uh, stories for the punters, you know, something that everybody's done or can relate to. And Nicole was... um, a very active girl from Brisbane. She rode a motorbike. She was a skydiver. She was a scuba diver. She was a hang glider. She, um, she every weekend, you know, she was a bushwalker. She was that kind of action girl. And she did aviation. She said she couldn't afford to do the aviation course. So she went and did law. She started law at uni thinking, if I become a lawyer, then I'll be rich enough to pay for flying lessons. I'll make enough money as a lawyer to be able to become a pilot. But um, something shifted. She didn't settle in that well to law and I think IT was the other thing. And she said, I just was, it was just a bad fit. And then they started the aviation degree at uni and so um, she swapped courses and she said, it was like I'd found my people and we used to go hiking and do all this stuff. They were the same kind of people in the aviation course as her. When she finished the course and people were applying to airlines and um, looking for for jobs, she decided, actually, I really want to cut my teeth and get a good grip on this flying caper. And so she went out to a cattle station in the Northern Territory. And before she went out there, the manager said to her, go and get some low-level flying training. So she went to a guy who was an ag pilot who had then set up a low-level training course and she rode her motorbike up to Kingaroy and Tony Pratt had her for a week and he um, taught her to fly uh, low and to think quick and to watch out for power lines. He At one point he pushed the control stick forward, pulled down low, flew under the power line and pulled up the other side. And he, when I rang him and said, why did you do that? And he said, because if you have to go under a power line, it's good to know that you've been under a power line and that you can do it if you have to. Don't do it if you don't have to. And um, so I found that fascinating, you know, the training that she did there. And then she went out to the cattle station and she was, uh, you know, servicing the plane and flying around this great 
big, vast spaces. And so her biggest challenge there was navigation. And then taking the um, the bore runners around on the to check all the bores. And so they'd be flying down almost at fence level so they could check that things were still working on the ground. Um, and she also did mustering. So she learned about managing livestock and um, flying the the intricacies of flying behind a mob you know you've got to be a certain height and be aware of the wind and the noise from the airplane not frightening the mob and she would radio through to the stockman and then she'd go back and look for stragglers and yeah there's a lot to learn about flying in the outback <laughs> so I just loved her um the way she never really fitted in like she said I'd never heard of a um an Akubra I'd never heard of I had to get a special belt. I had to get boots. I had to get special clothes. I had to go and find a country store and get a checked shirt and proper stockman's pants. And she said, I put these clothes on and I looked in the mirror and I felt like a circus clown because she said, I just felt ridiculous because it was so far removed from what she was used to dressing like. So, um, yeah, she, she was just kind of perplexed <laughs> for the whole beginning of her story. But she talks about the beauty of the outback and um, the nature, the wildlife, the flowers, the people that she came to know and love and the experiences. And those yeah. experiences, of course, led to a career in the Air Force. They did. Uh, she wasn't quite sure what her future was going to be, but she applied for an aerobatic scholarship with the Australian Women Pilots Association and she won the scholarship. And so she had to go to the conference to accept it. And at the conference, there was an Air Force girl talking about her experiences in the Air Force and what was required to get in and what a typical woman in the Air Force as a pilot, um, the profile. And it was um, a university education, strong social networks, um, whatever, the, you know, lots of different. There was about five, six things. And Nicole said, I just sat there listening to her and mentally ticking off each of them and thought, Hmm, maybe I can do it. And she had some pretty preconceived ideas about the Air Force inherited from um, her dad, uh, who definitely didn't want her to join the military of any kind. And um, But when she met these girls, she thought, actually, they're all pretty cool. <laughs> and so she applied and she was accepted and she was very surprised and she loves it. So she's now flying the KC-30, the air-to-air -air refueler. It's a great aircraft. It's a great story as well. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, Nicole was just constantly surprised by everything around her. But as I said at the end of her story, it didn't happen by accident. It was by having all these pre um, – having all these skills already that she'd acquired just by seeking opportunities and making the most of her opportunities that she found that she was actually well qualified to join the Air Force. Fantastic. Mm. And, Didn't um, happen by sitting on the couch, that's for sure. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it, sounds mm. like, it sounds like a full life even before she joined the Air Force. Yeah, yeah. It so, was very so full. The final uh, pilot we're going to look at is the story of Lynn Gray. Tell us about her. Lynn Gray, I love her story because she came into flying when she was about 40. It was actually her 38th or 39th birthday. Her brother gave her a flying lesson as a birthday present. I think she, I think her brother had done some flying himself and so you know 39 what are you going to buy your sister <laughs> so he gave her a flying lesson and that completely changed the course of her life and she gave up teaching and became a commercial pilot and she took up ferrying and she did uh, 10 years very successful 10 years ferrying aircraft from the US into Australia so you have to put the long-range fuel tanks uh, in the back, fuel bladders in the back to give you that extra oomph to get across. Um, she also was a flying instructor and I've spoken to some of her students who just raved about how calm and how lovely she is to fly with and, um, and how well she taught them. So she was probably exactly the right person to have in the aeroplane when something went wrong on one of those crossings and that was that the fuel tanks had been mis um the plumbing was not quite right and they were losing fuel fuel was streaming out the left wing 
overflowing out of that tank. And so suddenly they didn't have enough fuel to get to Hawaii and they didn't have enough to get back. And so they had to prepare for a ditching. And um, so they were in touch with the US Coast Guard and they were in touch with the other aircraft flying in tandem with them. And they had about six hours to prepare and um, and they did it. They put the aeroplane down on the water and they um, next to a ship and they um, were picked up by the ship and made it home. But it's a hell of a tale and a few people, I think I've had five people tell me that they could hardly breathe while they were reading that story and um, two or three women who know Lynn told me that they were crying. One said I was sobbing through that story and I said, why? You know that, you're, that she was all right, you had drinks with her in Perth and she said, I just never knew the details because Lynn's so understated, you know. She's not one to sit around and sob into her beer. Um, she just, uh, in fact, a couple of weeks later after getting home, she was back in the aeroplane. I think it was a month afterwards she went back and brought another aircraft that was only one serial number different and she flew that to Australia. And she said, I didn't want the ditching to end my career and I didn't want it to define me. And so she said it was very difficult to prepare for the next flight, but she pushed on with it. And once she got airborne out of the States, she was fine. And she was talking to all the airliners that had been talking to her on the way um, on the previous flight. And they were all surprised, amazed, actually, to hear that she was flying again. Just extraordinary yeah. stories. Absolutely. It is an extraordinary story. <laughs> Can I tell you my favourite bit Please in that do. story? <laughs> um, her, they, she was flying along and because she was down at 6,000 feet, because they had to shut down one engine, she was in a Seminole twin engine, and um, they shut down one engine and they, the airplane kind of settled, found its place at 6,000 feet. So to talk to the airliners flying above her, she could only have a contact for 15 minutes and then they'd be gone and they would hand her on to the next one. So they, were, they had contact, constant contact with all these different airlines. It was like the United Nations flying up there. And so... This aeroplane came, jet came on and they said, um, hi, this is uh, Cactus 456 or something, Cactus, whatever their flight number was. And Cactus is a nickname for US Airways, I think it was US Airlines. It was the one that Sully ditched in the Hudson, whatever that airline was, and their nickname was Cactus. And so this guy goes, it's Cactus, blah, 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 we're with you now. And he would have been very concerned, you know, as everybody was. And Lynn said, Cactus? Geez, mate, we're the ones that are cactus. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I laughed my head off when she told me. <laughs> and um, and I wrote in the story um, that her reply was rather laconic given the gravity of their cactusness because, <laughs> you know, what was ahead of her was very unpleasant thought. Um, but to make that joke, I just thought it was hilarious. So the following flight when she was talking to all these airliners um she was able to talk to cactus again and she explained to them what the meaning of cactus was <laughs> and they they remembered her so um we actually lynn and i had a bit of a joke about cactusness and i've submitted it to the urban dictionary so hopefully we can <laughs> let everyone know <laughs> based on that story it deserves to be in the in the dictionary uh, just, yeah, just, just based we, on that story alone we've claimed that word and i I um once I submitted the um, the manuscript to the publisher, they said, okay, you can't touch it now. You have to step away from it, and you cannot write anymore. Don't touch it. Don't tweak it. It's it's with the editor. So that was like the children leaving home. You know, it was what do I do with my hands? And I started drawing handbag tote bags, and I designed a bag for every pilot in the book. I just did it one night on the iPad and the one I did for Lynn <laughs> has a cactus on it and I wrote next to it comes with a snorkel <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah we got the cactus bag they're just fun Kathy they're just such extraordinary tales of extraordinary women what in your opinion why is it important that these stories are being told now many of them for the first time why is it important that you're telling these stories and that people know about what these women achieved I think because the aeroplane doesn't know who's flying it. It shouldn't matter if you're man, woman or donkey. You know, it's, if you can fly the aeroplane, uh, it shouldn't matter. Um, and I think, you know, these days women get a fair go. Um, 
there's plenty of women in aviation and coming into aviation. Historically, there was, uh, what's the word, where they, um, discrimination. But um, I think these days I'd like women, to, girls, to see aviation as a viable career, which I didn't when I was younger. And um, I just think they're such great stories and, and they just happen to be women pilots that, that were doing it, you know. And as I said, there was just this great feeling of camaraderie in that room when Pat Tools told her story. Um, it's just, I don't know, you know, girls like to get together for a gossip session, don't they? Cup of tea and a scone and tell us a story. Well, <laughs> so, it's, um, it's a great achievement. It's more like a gin and a gin and beer nuts or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really the normal afternoon tea stories. But um, they're just such, I just wanted really readable stories and a different angle just to come at aviation from a slightly different angle because all our bookshelves are full of uh, men. But, you know, Kristen Alexander has written a fabulous book on Laurie Bonney. That's in the National Library. Um, I know Cathy Salver is, she's in the Women Pilots Association. She's writing a book on somebody and I can't remember who it is. And there's a girl named Tash Heap. She's written a book as well. So there's a few women pilots coming to the fore. Um, there was also the fabulous flying Mrs. Miller. That, I really enjoyed that one. Um, she That came out a few years ago. So she was an Australian as well. Well, it's a great achievement, Cathy. And the book is called Australian Women Pilots, Amazing True Stories of Women in the Air. It's available now uh, Australia-wide. Uh, Cathy, um, just wonderful. Thank you for coming on the program and talking to us about it. Uh, it's just a great achievement. These stories really deserve to be told. So so congratulations on telling them in such an engaging way. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's my first book. I never in my wildest dreams imagined I'd be writing a book, but I stuck with it. And um, it was a big thrill this week. It's national. The National Library has got it as their book of the week. So um, for the girl who almost failed English in year 12, I'm pretty, hey, pretty proud of that. You should be. Congratulations and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. See ya. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast and visit livinghistorytv.com for more great history content.